for joining us. Hello everyone, welcome. Welcome to our friends on Instagram and Facebook. And of course, our regular Zoomers as well. Bruchim Abayim, welcome everybody. Okay, thanks for joining us. Uh, today's class is called, Are You a Control Freak? You know, when I started um, working as a rabbi, which happened to be right before September 11, 2001. Yes, that's how old I am. I wrote down a number of ideas that were going through my head. I was actually meant to speak on September 11. I was booked to speak at Fordham Law School. We had a large group of Jewish students who were there and they contacted me and I was a young fledging rabbi and they said, come by and speak and we were all ready to go. And I was prepared to go down. And of course, as we know, the news came through very early um, at what had happened. I think I was actually in the Bet Knesset in synagogue that morning. Uh, and of course, everything transpired. Afterwards, I wrote down a, number, a bit of information. I went through my notes recently, which I have a large stack of different parts of the house, actually. And I found this talk and it was literally like it had been written during this pandemic that we're going through. So we're going to talk about being a control freak. Um, and we're going to mention the pandemic along the way as well, because that's one of the <clears throat> things that is the results of us going through this pandemic has woken us up to a lack of feeling of control. We're going to come to that in a minute. But I want to start with a different question. And um, you can answer in your, in your mind, or you can type it in if you want. And the question is, what's the difference between religion and spirituality? Religion and spirituality. You know, nowadays, I'll give you a little secret. Let me let the customer behind the counter. Nowadays, my friends, we don't really, rabbis and people who run programming, I'm sure Jessica can attest to this, when we make flyers for programs and invite people, the word religion, we don't usually like to use. It doesn't really attract many people. Come into our religious service and everything's going to be amazing. But the word spirituality and being spiritual, ah, now that's, that's open, you know, it's beautiful, it's undefined, it's just this vague term that makes you feel fuzzy somewhere in your stomach. You know, I, um, I'll talk about this more about today actually, but one of the things I used to do when I was in my rabbinical training over 20 years ago was that you study obviously a body of information, I'm a rabbi, People ask me how to become a rabbi. Very simple. Go to rabbi.com and you, no, I'm kidding, right? So whatever you do, become a rabbi, become a rabbi. But there's a body of knowledge you have to study. But many uh, rabbinical courses, the one I went through especially, allowed you to try various different things in order to get experience in a field that interests you. So one of my friends took on a pulpit. He actually subsequently became a pulpit rabbi. He actually just quit that recently. Uh, one of my friends got into kashrut, Right? Kosher is a big area of, you know, rabbinical work. Uh, some sort of working in a school with young children. I, the Meshuggah that I am, I started to get very involved with an organization called JAX. JAX is a Jewish alcoholic, chemically dependent and significant others organization. Basically, it's an organization for Jewish addicts. And they would hold these long weekends um, where they would have... Jewish addicts come from all over the country. Actually, they came from all over the world. And every type of Jew, from Jews who found out they were Jewish yesterday, Jews who were completely irreligious, Jews who were Hasidic from Brooklyn. We had Haredi Jews, Muncy, you name it. Safari makes a difference. Addictions doesn't see a difference beside from the various forms of Jewish groups and sects that we have. So a major part of Bavi's The Fascinating Weekend, it's an amazing organization. 
And I actually went back many, many times. I actually eventually went back when I was a younger man as a teen counsellor, which was a very powerful and enlightening um, experience. Um, one of the, there's a lot of slogans, which I'm going to speak about in future classes, the addicts use. And one of them was this question, the difference between religion and spirituality. So one of the slogans they have is, religion is for those people who are afraid of going to hell. Spirituality is for those people who've been there. That was one of the very clever slogans. Religion is for those people who are afraid of going to hell. Spirituality is for those people who've been there. In other words, spirituality is for people who've been through challenge and difficulty and have grown some way, somehow through that experience. Okay, it's a very powerful and a beautiful slogan. But why do we kind of feel like religion just to sound good? And spirituality kind of like speaks to us, especially in our generation. We'll see why in our generation specifically in a few moments. And I think one of the reasons is that religion has connotations, has overtones or maybe undertones of someone trying to control me and tell me what to do. Religion has inside it this idea. I'm not saying whether this is true or not. I'm just saying what the word gives off. It gives us this idea that someone is trying to control me and tell me what to do and don't tell me what to do. Was the world always like this? I'm going to posit today that it wasn't. Things have changed. Things have changed. It used to be that religion was very popular, right? And pretty much everyone was, if not religious per se, but they were affiliated with the religion and they felt safe. Um, they felt connected to it. So there's many reasons why. But they wouldn't feel threatened by this feeling of control. And yet we've seen over the past few years, right? I wouldn't even say even decades, but there's been this pushback away from religion. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm just stating what is. And a move towards spirituality, individual spiritual service, however you want to call it. The English words are never going to suffice when it comes to describing these ideas. But we're going to try our best. So religion is the idea of control. And there's been this move away from people who want to be controlled. You may know there are, um, in the religious world, there are various... Um, Letters we use to describe things. You may have heard of the expression a BT. A BT is a Baal Teshuva. A Baal Teshuva. Then you have the um, FFB, the from from birth. The Baal Teshuva, the new person in religion. The FFB, the one who's been religious, the from from birth. Right? Then you have the ZBT, the zealous Baal Teshuva. Right? They're the one who came religious recently and was like going crazy, you know. Then you have the FBT, the flaming Baal Tshuva, right? They're the ones who are like running around telling everyone to keep Shabbat and go crazy, you know? Going... But there's one that I heard a number of years ago, and some of you may have heard of it, and it's the OTD. In my house, these three letters are heard regularly. Oh, her? She's OTD. Oh, that guy? He's OTD. What is that? Off the derech. Off the derech, which means off the way. This usually describes, in a sad way, and it's not a good thing, it's just a child who grew up in a ostensibly religious home, keeping Shabbat and kosher and other mitzvot, going to synagogue and worrying to fill in, and they've given that up. They've moved away. They're OTD, they're off the derech, they're off the path of religious Judaism. And there's, I mean, it's fairly recent, a whole new area of Jewish outreach which used to be there, which I've been involved with 20 years, of reaching outside the community of Jews who grew up completely unaffiliated and bring them in under the, you know, into this world of, of, of Judaism, which was very, very popular. And now there's been this shift into this world of dealing with kids, what's called Kir of Kurovim, not Kir of Rehob. Kir of Rehobim is trying to bring people who grew up with no Judaism whatsoever into our communities, into learning Torah, doing mitzvot and, you know, enjoying a Jewish life, becoming an educated Jew, which is our best consumer. And now we're like, well, a second, there's a lot of kids who grew up religious. And unfortunately, they've moved away. What about them? Don't they deserve some kind of like outreach, some kind of Jewish experience? Happens to be the two have now crossed over. 
many of the kids who are OTD end up getting involved with the BTs and that's become a whole thing in of itself. When you speak to these young men and women for the reasons of why they've abandoned their faith, many of them temporarily, many of them as a long-term plan, many of them say they didn't like the control. They There's many reasons why. I'm not trying to just limit it to one soundbite. But many will say they felt that they were being controlled, they didn't have a voice, they didn't feel spiritual in their service. It was too religious, not spiritual enough. And whatever that meant to them or means to them, it means to them. But it's a real thing. They're talking from the heart, right? And they mean it, right? Usually I have found it's not intellectual reasons that led them away. Usually it's emotional reasons. That's my own personal experience. I want to share with you, my friends, today an idea that goes like this. Everybody is trying to control everybody else. Everyone is trying to control everybody else. Husbands are trying to control their wives and wives are trying to control their husbands. Parents are trying to control their kids and kids, children, are trying to control their parents. Brothers, sisters, employers trying to control their employees, employees, their employees. Everyone is trying to control everybody else and they'll use a variety of means to achieve that end. But really, nobody is controlling anybody. You know, we, we all became part of this crazy thing called the pandemic. And I mean, for me, I actually I wrote this idea down after September 11, but the same idea applies. We get to these points in our lives where we just feel in control, don't we? Everything's just going good. Generally speaking, we got our jobs and we're going on vacation and we're getting on planes and we're even hugging and kissing people. We're just in control. And everything is just going smoothly. And then in the blink of an eye, whether it's September 11, those people who remember it, or this pandemic, the rug is pulled out from under us and we're like, what's going on? Why can't I do what I want to do? Why am I being told to do this and that when I don't want to do it? Whatever it is, wear a mask, don't walk over there, don't touch that person, don't speak to them, don't walk into your synagogue, your church, your mosque, you can't go to work, can't make a living, and suddenly we've been inundated with this control. And you can't help. I'm not agreeing with one side. I'm just trying to analyze what's going on and why it's such a problem. Everyone, or most people, just push back. We cannot handle trying to be controlled by these forces that are outside of us. There's this natural instinct that we don't want to be controlled. And I've had numerous emails and texts and WhatsApps and phone calls of people who this whole pandemic has turned their life upside down, not just financially, okay, but that as well, but religiously because they can't be involved in it. People are stuck at home and they're not in control of their lives. That's very, very, very difficult. You know, there's a, a great metaphor for this, you know, there's a great metaphor of these people who are, you know, it's holding on, they can't take it, of which I am as well. You know, have you ever seen a bird on a string or a, a wire? You see him sleeping on the phone wire sometimes. Have you ever wonder, I wondered how the bird holds on? It's an amazing thing. This creature, it's this thin wire, and the bird has its claws over this wire, and then the bird falls asleep. Now you try that. You could probably sit hold on to a wire. Right? Suspended. But fall asleep. What would happen? You would automatically let go of your hands and you'd fall down. And yes, something is quite amazing about birds. Birds are able to sit on thin wires and fall asleep and not fall off. Does anyone know why birds don't fall off? Well, I'll say something very interesting. The bird is created with a very unusual and unique ability. And that is, its claws clamp down. And even while the bird is asleep, even while it's asleep, it doesn't release its claws, because if it did, it would fall off and die. 
the branch, the pole, whatever it is. So God created the birds with this amazing function that while they're at rest, their claws are still holding on. I think that's a great metaphor for many, many people today. They look calm and they look relaxed and they're even going to sleep, but they're barely hanging on. The tension that they have inside them, this feeling of lack of control they're going through, they're just barely holding on because they feel if they let go, they're going to fall off and that's going to be the end of it. So they're literally just sitting there in this nervous wreck state, unable to... But we already pointed out that it's a delusion. We are not in control. And parents can't control their kids. And kids can't control their parents. I mean, we call it manipulation. But that's what manipulation is, isn't it? Manipulation between spouses, children to their parents. Everyone's trying to control everybody else. But that's not what we should be doing. People have come to believe they're in control. And this actually is an illusion of omnipotence. You know, this, um, at one of these Jack's retreats, there was, um, as I said, there are many different types of uh, addicts who attend these retreats. Some religious, some not religious. And they have services that actually had orthodox services, conservative reform services, And obviously there are many people there who don't go to services at all. It's it's, it's a weekend. So, you know, I was one of the rabbis at this retreat. And obviously I went to uh, my service. So on Friday night, we had this group meeting. And there was a a young man there, a young kid. Must have been his teens. And he said, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in anything. Okay. There are many such people. There's many such Jews. So that was fine. And that was part of his describing his situation, his qualification, happens to be that part of the 12-step program is that you need to have a connection to a higher power. They don't tell you what the higher power should be. You can be whatever you want. God, any form of higher power, a light bulb, whatever you want to believe in, bananas, whatever you want to believe in, but needs the higher power. The next day I went to synagogue, Shabbat morning, and I see this young man is in the synagogue with us. So I walked over to him, very openly, we were, had this open conversation, and I said, Max, last night you told me you're an atheist. You don't actually need to come to services. Why are you here? Why are you praying in synagogue? And he says something amazing, which stayed with me for many, many years. He says, Rabbi, I come to synagogue sometimes, and I pray all the time, so that I don't think that I'm God. I'll say those words again. This really struck me and stayed with me. I pray so that I don't think that I'm God. Yeah. And I think what he was saying, and you can understand his words anyway you want to. You see, he realized his life was out of control. His drinking, his drug taking, his relationships, out of control. He needed to get better. If he just relied on his own power, it wasn't going to work. We already saw that which is why he ended up in this terrible state in the first place of being a using alcoholic drug addict. He had to put his faith in something. He had to believe there was, that's why the expression higher power, is a very good expression. There's something above me. I have to believe that. The form of it, Judaism, whatever, we'll leave that aside. There needs to be something above me because if there isn't, I'm in control of my life and I've already shown myself and my family and friends that I'm not. And therefore, although I'm an atheist, I still pray just to realize there's got to be something above me who can help me get out of my terrible and dire situation. Now, this delusion of control that we have, this thought that we can control other people, and there's many methods, I'm sure you realize, that people use to control other people. I mean, you can put a gun to someone's head. That's control. A temporary effect, because eventually the gun goes down, okay? And this person's going to... You can use uh, violence, anger. Of course, there's the Jewish mother and father favorite, guilt. Oh, we're great at that, right? As my mother would say to me as a kid, eat your dinner and finish up your vegetables. And I'm like, I don't want to. And what did my mother always say? There's children who are starving in Africa. In my day, it was Biafra. But I guess the same thing. So 
as like a, a 10 year old, I was like, what's that got to do with me? I mean, I'm 10. I was living in England at the time. So this kid's starving enough, what's it got to do with me? If they're starving, then take the food I don't want to eat, put it in an envelope and mail it to them. What, what do you want from me? It's a form of control. It's a form of guilt. I'm not saying it doesn't always work. It does work many times, but it's not the way, right thing to do. I want to show you how this delusion of control that we have is relatively new. I don't think it's something our grandparents and definitely not our gra great grandparents actually were subject to. You see, we now drive amazing cars, right? Fantastic cars that do so much for us. There's cruise control, there's temperature, we can sync it to our phone, we can talk to our car, our car listens to us, it answers us, we can type in on Waze, beautiful Israeli company, I want to go here, a lovely voice comes over, please make the next left. I'm like, oh, if my wife's in the car, I'm like, why can't you speak to me like that? Oh, so nice. If I take a wrong turn, it's not like one of my kids, Abba, you missed the exit again. We're going to be late. I get Siri or I get the Waze voice say, please turn around. The exit will be in your right in two minutes. Ah, oh, that's nice. Makes me feel good, you know? Before the car, how do most people get around? Horses. Horses, donkeys, camels. I'm not even sure. But they weren't driving cars 100 years ago. Now, when you rode a horse, you were never fully in control. You had to hold on to the reins. You couldn't control the horse. What you could do, now this is very important, you could offer the horse something, an offer that it couldn't refuse. The horse wanted to go left. You pulled on the reins, which was attached to the metal bit in the mouth of the horse. It felt a pain and it pulled back and it went to the right. If the horse was hungry, it was a struggle to get away from that thing. So the feeling of control wasn't complete. When you rode a horse or a donkey, you had to work hard to keep it on track. Nowadays, the cars that come off the production line in 2020 have more computer power than the Apollo space mission rocket that went up into space. We, as a driver of a car in 2020, have more technology on board our cars than they did for the rockets they sent up to satellites as space and to the moon. That's the amount of power we now have under our control. Talking about that, I mean, let's say you go to supermarket. I mean, supermarkets, oh, I'm not talking against these things. I have a car, it's a great thing. But it's worth realizing that there's a consequence to the societies we live in. You go to a supermarket, they're havens of control. You want to buy bread, you buy bread. You want to buy an apple, you buy an apple. You don't think about the tree it grew on and the nurturing and the men or women had to go and pick it off and put it in a basket and put it into a truck and schlep it and buy it and sell it. Right? You just go, you buy and that's it. You don't feel connected to it. Have you ever seen an apple on a tree? Literally the most boring object ever. The apple in the supermarket has a sheen of wax that has been added to it to give this beautiful shine. An apple on a tree basically just hangs there, you know, saying there's dull fruit, right? We've manipulated everything around us and controlled it so it fits. You buy bread, you buy bread. You don't think about the fact that it was wheat once. It was cut. I mean, we know it. We don't think about it. It's all ready to go. Our ancestors didn't have that, right? They had to figure out where to buy flour, where to buy the water, how to make it, yeast, find an oven, which was a big deal, like the oven, which was even a bigger deal, get a fire going, try doing that in 2020, even that's impossible. That's just the way it was. You were in control. And now we send off these satellites to space. I remember when I was five, six years old, they sent the Voyager 1 satellite up. And I remember watching this on TV as a kid. And I was like, wow, we've just sent this satellite for a multi-decade journey up into space. That means somewhere, someone was sitting down with controls, moving the controls left a little bit, and this satellite in space was moving to the left. And they were moving the controls to the right, and the satellite was moving to the right. Can you blame us 
for trying to control everything around us, if I can control and manipulate my food, if I control my car, if a person, we've reached the stage in history that a person sitting here somewhere in the middle of the United States can control an object a billion miles away, then of course I can control my employees who are at the office next door, my kids who are in the room at the end of the corridor, my wife who's lying in the bed next to me, of course. I mean, if I can control everything, I definitely control the people around me. I don't think this is how people used to think, okay? I mean, kids today grew up with a level of control that we can't even fathom. When I was a kid, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not like, oh, the good old days, right? But it's true. For me, entertain was, I took a little plastic car, I went, mm, 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 I let go, it hit the wall. I then had to walk over to the wall, pick up the car, turn around and do it again. Right? And now, I mean, my kids are, you know, Roblox, TikTok and all the rest of it, right? They have a better hold and control of technology. We're bringing up a generation and it's worth being aware of. I'll give you a couple of antidotes to this, if I may, in a few moments. But we've created a society, we created a, a time in history where everyone is able to control everything. But we already established that no one can control anybody else. You know, I went to a rabbinical conference a number of years ago. I think I mentioned this story before, but it's a very good story. And uh, I'm not saying the rabbinical conferences are such interesting events, but this one happened to be a very cool one. At the end of the conference, they set up a dais, a big table, and behind it, they put a group of experts and a bunch of the rabbis sitting out in the audience who would shoot questions. And uh, they had a social worker, therapist, a uh, famous rabbi was up there, a psychiatrist. And we would post questions, written or oral questions. And this was a number of years ago. And someone in the audience asked the panel what the panel thought was the reason for the high divorce rates. And we live in a society, supposedly divorce rates are 50 plus percent what is the reason for the high divorce rates in society today? And each expert gave their answers. Not enough love, not love giving, infidelity, incompatibility, whatever reasons they came up with. Interestingly, I did read that a vast amount of divorces are attributed to social media nowadays, but we'll leave that aside. Or maybe it's related to this point as well. So there was a, um, a psychiatrist up on the, um, on the dais who... Uh, stood up and lifted up a plastic pen like this one and said, this is the reason for the high divorce rates. And he sat down. Um, and I thought to myself, okay, this psychiatrist, his name was Dr. Abraham Tversky. I thought he'd been self-medicating. I'm like, I'm sorry, what? Plastic pens are the reasons for high divorce rates. What's this guy talking about? And he made the following amazing point, which just changed my life. He says, you know, this pen I picked up at a hotel I was at or a local store. I'm going to finish writing with it and then I'm going to throw it away and I'm going to buy a new one. And this cell phone, you know, that I have, that I use, it's going to break eventually. And I'm going to throw it away. I'm going to get a new one. And this plastic cup I'm drinking out of, I'm going to finish drinking it. I'm going to crumple it up. I'm going to throw it away and I'm going to get a new one. And this car that the brakes are failing, they're not going to fix the brakes. They're going to take them out and they're going to put in new ones. We've created this disposable culture. If it breaks, throw it away, get a new one. I remember from my bar mitzvah, Someone got me a pen. You know, um, the Mont Blanc pens with the white blob on top? I always thought it was a Star of David. It's not. I think it's the Alps or a mountain top. Anyway, I love this pen. I mean, I had a relationship with a pen. I don't mean like a relationship. Mm, but I had a relationship with this pen, you know? And I kept it for many years. And I used to use it in school. I think I even got it into university, you know? And eventually I lost it. But when I used to lend it out to people, I'd hold onto the cap to make sure I got the pen back. I had a relationship with it, but now I have this. I throw it away, I get a new one. Your car breaks, throw it, get a new one. 
Your pen breaks, throw it again. Your phone breaks, throw it again, a new one. Your plastic cups finished, throw Your marriage breaks, throw it away, get a new one. I'm not saying that's the cause of divorce, but it's definitely one of the symptoms. And we're all subject to this. This disposable culture that we're part of has become such an integral part of who we are as people. It's impacted us that it's now impacting our relationships as well. I mean, for those people who are old enough, you may remember getting, I mean, think back, a letter in the mail. All right, let me explain to those people who are under 20. A letter was a piece of paper, right? Uh, oh, paper. Oh, paper is this product that we get from wood, which comes from trees. And it was very nicely and flat. And people used to write on this. And the feeling of getting a letter, jokes aside, was, remember that feeling of getting a letter? Someone actually bothered to sit down and write your name out with a pen. And they would fold it and they would put it into an envelope and they would mail it and it would take a few days to get to you and you would open up the mailbox and there would be this letter with your name on and so it actually taken a few moments to write information to you and it made you feel really, really special. You felt great about yourself. Okay, now I know most mail that comes today is basically junk mail and people asking you for money, but we'll leave that aside. But main communication, now we have this thing called email. I'm not saying email's a bad thing, right? I'm sending 50,000 emails a day. But there's a consequence to this. We've created this constant culture where the email comes, delete, 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 delete. Dating. Right? When I dated, back to more than 20 years ago, I was a piece of paper about information. I had to schlep out, meet this person. No one provided photos in these days. You basically just met this person. Everything, everyone, every date was a blind date, unless you knew the person you were about to go on a date with. right? And you went on a date and... And now it's swipe left, swipe right, swipe, swipe, swipe. Again, I'm not against internet dating, but it's impacting us. Kids. We're seeing that many people think they control their kids. The truth is, oh, by the way, I must tell you one thing. I was at a, uh, back to the drug clinic. I was at this uh, drug meeting and there was a guy running the meeting, a drug counselor. <laughs> this is amazing. And uh, he had a bunch of teenagers with us. And he said to these kids, he said, you know, guys, I got a drug for you today. And the kids were like, what? Because, yeah, today you can take a drug. Really? Yep. Not only that, one dollar a hit. And the kids were like, the counselor's gone crazy. He went into his pocket, he opened his hand, and there was a pile of colored pills that he had prepared before the discussion. And the kids were about to grab his, oh, one second, one second. There's a catch. There's always a catch. What's the catch? Because the catch is, ready for this? The high from this drug is not going to kick in for 24 hours. For 24 hours, you're not going to get any high whatsoever. But after 24 hours, you're going to feel the most amazing, exquisite high you have ever experienced in your life. If I wasn't there to see it, I wouldn't have believed it. Not one kid took a pill. Why? Why do I take drugs? Because I want immediate gratification now. I can wait 24 hours for my high. I want it now. I can't push off the cake, right? Or the chocolate for 24 hours. I want it now. I want immediate gratification. I want to be in control. And every addict, by definition, whether they like to hear it or not, is a control freak. And we all are. And so make me high now, or I don't want to be high at all. Wait 24 hours? It's not going to happen. We think we control kids. We don't control our children. We just give them an offer they can't refuse. You see, kids fight back against us. And they don't want to do it. I don't want homework. And so we threaten them or incentivize them to do something. And so the kids, as it were, sign a contract. I need stuff. My parents are not going to give me stuff unless I do X, Y, Z to make them happy. But let's be clear. It's a short-term contract I'm signing. I'm only going to listen to you 
because I need you. Because I want you to buy me stuff, clothes, sneakers, food, not shatter me or go crazy. So I'm going to buy in to your little control thing. So parents think they're controlling their kids. They're not controlling kids. You cannot control your children. Short term, you can threaten, get angry, but you're not controlling them. They're just signing in on a document. But as soon as they become independent and they don't need you anymore, and you haven't built a real relationship, the document's ripped up. It's done. It was a temporary thing in the first place. And that's when I get parents calling me all the time, just yesterday. My son is dating a girl. I don't want to marry her for whatever reason. He won't listen to me. I feel like Cynthia, did he ever listen to you? Oh yeah. When he was 12, he was such a good little boy. I'm like, he wasn't listening to you. At the age of 12, you gave your child an offer he could not refuse. You thought you were controlling your child. You weren't. There was a virtual contract that every, pretty much every child signs. I will listen to you because I need stuff. Food, shelter, money, pocket money, vacations. But let's be clear. This is just a short-term deal we're making. As soon as I'm independent, I'm done. The contract's ripped up because I don't need you anymore. So the truth is, we think we're controlling our kids with anger, shouting, manipulation. As we said before, guilt. These do work, but they're short term. Eventually, the gun has to be dropped. You can't constantly hold a gun to someone's head. And this child is going to do whatever they want to do. Happens to be, interestingly, that in Jewish life, we have a concept which is built into Jewish law of deferring gratification. There's many examples in Jewish life we defer gratification. I mean, it's simple stuff, like, I want to go to that event, I want to go, but it's Shabbat, so I can't, so I'm going to have to defer my gratification. But from a young age, I go to the supermarket with my child, go to the su kosher supermarket, I want that candy. No, you can't have it, but I want it. I got it. I want it, I want it, I want it, I want it. And they, what do they do? They manipulate us. Kids try to control us. We said everyone's trying to control everybody else. And they'll lie down on the floor. Have right? you ever seen that parent with a kid kicking his legs up and down, screaming, I want it, I want it, I want it. That's me, I'm the parent. Right? What do we usually do? Well, my wife never gives in. I'm like, I'll take whatever you want. Right? Just stop embarrassing me in public. Right? We just do that. We think we're actually, the kids think they're controlling us. We think we're controlling them, but we're not. But if I go to a non-kosher supermarket, and my, set, my kid says, I want that thing. I'm like, you can't have it, it's not kosher. That's the end of discussion. They won't say, no, I want it. They know that it's out of bounds. Inbuilt into our system is this thing called deferring gratification. I want to talk to that person, but I'm praying right now, I can't. So much, this isn't the reason for the mitzvot, but it happens to be one of the benefits, right? I just had a steak and now I want some cheesecake. You're going to have to wait. But I want it now. You can't. Part of religion, or if you prefer spirituality, but in the end it is religion, is learning to defer gratification. And from a very early age, part of the Jewish uh, life that we give our kids is to instill in them the idea that you can't have it now. Some things you're going to have to just push off and save for another time. You know, there's a twist in all this. I've run way past my time. I knew I'd do this with this class. I have so much more to tell you. You know, there's a twist in this. Here's the twist, and I'll leave you with this idea. Who is really in control of their lives? Because for most of us, our lives are out of control. But you know who's really in control? The person that says, I'm not in control. The one who thinks they're in control is not in control. But the person who says, my life has become unmanageable, I'm not in control, that person, ironically, is actually in control. I had an acquaintance who I was friends with many, many years ago, and uh, he was a drug addict. And uh, anyone who knows Manhattan, Manhattan is pretty much shaped like a diamond. He used to work on the west side of Manhattan, and he used to, back in those days, this is pre-Giuliani, he used to pick up drugs along the west side highway. I heard this story from him directly. And uh, 
he eventually decided after many years of drug abuse, he needed to get over his drug addiction. So he used to drive up and down the Western Highway for business, but he felt that the steering wheel kept pushing towards his old buying drugs area, and it was very, very difficult for him. He realized he was out of control. He knew he'd end up taking drugs again. So he said, I'm not in control. So he took upon himself the following, and my friend who's watching, Chaim Dov Nagy, uh, knows this guy as well, and said the following thing. He took upon himself, just listen to this, never to drive on the West Side Highway again, which by the way, is a crazy thing to do. Because he used to do business on the West Side Highway, that means he had to go down the other side of the Diamond of Manhattan on the FDR and cut across town. And if you know Manhattan traffic at all, crossing town, can take you longer than it takes to drive there from right here where I am, right? Monty, Long Island, wherever you are. He admitted he was under control. Ironically, he is in control because he was able to avoid the problem altogether. Who is the person who is really in control, whose life has become manageable, is the person who says, I'm not in control. I cannot, and people say, just control yourself. Just don't buy the drugs. And he's like, I can't. I want those drugs. I want that chocolate cake. And the answer is, if you want a chocolate cake, sorry, if you don't want a chocolate cake, but you have a desire for it, don't hang out in cake shops. If you know that person is going to lead you to do bad things, stay away from that person. But you would say, no, 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 no. Hang out with that person and control yourself. You're like, but I can't control. It's out of control. So you know what? I'm in control. I'm going to avoid the problem altogether. I'm not going to fight head on because it's not going to work. And therefore, what I'm going to do is I'm going to avoid the problem altogether. In Kabbalah, they call this taking the longer, shorter road, I think is how they describe it. I'm going to take a longer road, but it's shorter because it's less of a struggle. Such is the person. I'll add one last thing and say that we do have one other training mechanism to help us realize we're not in control, that's Shabbat. Shabbat teaches us that we're not in control. We stop all creative activity for one day a week. That means a seventh of our lives we're not creating to say that I'm not in control. God is the ultimate controller. That's one of the, maybe not reasons, although actually is a reason, right? We rest on the seventh day because Hashem rested, right? Because Hashem is the creator and I'm the creator. So just keeping Shabbat as part of our lives teaches us I can't be in control of everything. So at least for my kids, and hopefully yours as well, at least one day a week, they are out of control. There's no technology. There's no internet. There's no games, right? They just have to be present. They cannot do anything creative and take control of the environment that we are fully in control of. This is the greatest training to teach us that we're not in control, and hakol b'deh shemayim, chutz mir shemayim, that God is ultimately in control, and we just live in God's world. Okay, friends, thank you for joining. I way exceeded my time limit today. I hope you don't mind. Thank you for joining us. Have a great and successful week, and we'll pick this up next week, God willing. Shalom, shalom.